Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Dr. Dominic Dalip and I'm a recent graduate from St. George's University. Currently, I'm a research fellow here at Seattle Science Foundation and I'm going to be presenting today on a comprehensive review of the Fabella bone. This is a recently published article on June 5th, 2018. So just as an overview, I would be just talking about the anatomy of the fabella bone, the pathologies related to it, um, the treatment options that we have, and how, and how do we diagnose this. So what is the fabella bone? The first time I was doing this, like, I wasn't familiar as what the fabella bone is. Um, so just as to explain what it is, is a sesamoid bone that is located in the um, lateral head of the gastrocnemius and it articulates uh, directly with the lateral femoral condyle. Now a sesamoid bone is a bone that is um, developed within a tendon. So it, it, it is fairly um, common in the general population. It occurs uh, 10 to 30 percent um, of the time in the general population and it, um, it occurs 80 percent of the time bilaterally. However, in Asian population, it is seen to be more common. So we see it like 25 to 87% of the time in, in Asians. So this is um, what the fabella bone looks like. So if it is, we could have a look here. We see that you have the common fibular nerve that passes um, just at the side of it. And you have the surrounding structures here in the popliteal fossa. So this is a lateral head of the gastrocnemius here, and we could see that the fabella is embedded there. So just try to remember the common fibular nerve and where it passes, because that would become very important in the pathology that is explained further. So the fabella bone can be of two types. They could be bony or cartilaginous. Um, in one study where 150 um, fabellae were dissected, 72 were found to be cartilaginous and 27 were found to be um, bony. And the size ranged from 5 millimeters to 20 millimeters. In this, um, in this uh, picture, it's like about 1 millimeter, I mean 1 centimeter. So because they're, it's of a cartilaginous nature, um, it's thought to be found, um, is actually formed from an endochondral ossification, which is one of the two types of um, bone tissue formation. Um, endochondral ossification um, involves uh, cartilage, whereas intramembranous, which is the other type, it, it does not. So that's why this is formed from endochondral ossification. So sesamoid bones are usually formed from stress on tendon. So it was postulated that the reason why, from an ev evolutionary standpoint, the reason why this fabella bone is formed is because um, moving from all fours or quadru quadrupedal um, posturing to standing on um, bipedal posturing, that's, that's maybe why it is you have this um, fabella being formed. Um, the main function of the fabella is uh, it's a stabilizer between the fab fabella complex and the medial femoral condyle. And these are the structures that make up the fabella complex. So you have like the plantaris, the gastrocnemius, and you have all these three ligaments here. So there are various pathologies associated with the fabella bone. One is the fabella pain syndrome. You could have fracture of the fabella. Uh, common fibular nerve palsy, as we, as I mentioned before, and there's this rare phenomenon known as the popliteal artery entrapment syndrome. So I'll be talking about the treatment and as we go along, so that I, um, we could better understand the diagnosis and everything at the same time. So for Bellopane syndrome, um, the patient usually presents with posterior lateral knee pain, and it's worse than fully extending. Now this is a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you rule out things such as meniscal tears, lateral ligament instability, Baker's cyst, and proximal tibiofibular joint hypomobility. When you rule out all of those and the patient still has um, persistent posterior lateral knee pain, 
you could do uh, X-ray or CT scan to confirm that they have a fabella, and then you could postulate or you could think about fabella pain syndrome as one of the diagnosis. So it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So this, some of the treatment options that we have for this is physical therapy, steroid inju injection, radial extracorporeal shockwave therapy, or fabellectomy, where we take out the fabella. So just to explain a little bit more about physical therapy, the patient is put in a prone position and um, the legs are supported at a 30 degree flexion. Then pressure is applied along the gastroxoleus complex and in that way you kind of like stretch the gastrocnemius a little bit. And this typically takes about three minutes you try to do this for and then you repeat it on a daily basis for like about two to three weeks and around that time you have a decrease in the pain. Um, so yeah, the other um, treatment option that I wanted to explain is the shockwave therapy, which I thought was interesting. So in, in this case, you, you deliver 3,000 shockwaves at a frequency of 12 hertz. You do it three to four times at two week intervals. Now the mechanism by which this works is that it destroys the unmyelinated um, sensory nerves and also it has a hyperstimulation analgesic effect. And this was very effective. Um, within two to three days, you have patients that uh, first started with a pain intensity of eight to 10. And uh, after three to four days, it decreased the uh, pain intensity two to zero. You could also have fracture, fracture of the fibula. So this is usually caused by either direct stress or trauma. So patients usually present with swelling and pain in the posterior lateral aspect of the knee. And to diagnose a fracture, you could use either CT or MRI to confirm the diagnosis, and this could help you to guide the therapy. So typically for fracture of the fibula, you use conservative therapy. If this fails or if it is, it's really severe, you could take out the whole fibula, so you could do a fibulectomy. So coming over to common fibular nerve palsy is another um, pathology that could be associated with the fibula. Uh, seven cases have been reported, and in t about 21% of cases, you have the common fibular nerve running posteriorly to the fibula. Now patients usually present with decreased sensation in the, in the dermatome of the common fibular nerve, so that's on the top of the foot and the outer leg. They could also be presenting with foot drop and weakness in the ankles um, of the feet. So fewer cases were reported uh, in obese patients, and this is thought to be because there is more subcutaneous fat there, so it kind of helps protect the nerves. Treatment is usually by uh, conservative, and if that fails, you could perform for balectomy or if it's really severe. So popliteal artery entrapment syndrome is a very rare, um, a rare case. The first case was described in 1965, and there has only been one case report so far in the literature of the fibella compressing the popliteal artery. And, and in that case, a CT angio was used to, this, um, to diagnose it, and it was treated with fibrolectomy and revascularization of the popliteal artery. So in conclusion, uh, this is a rare um, cause of pos um, persistent posterior lateral pain, and it should be considered by physicians, um, so that could help guide therapy and give patients a better care. Also, when you're doing um, neurovascular surgery or any vascular surgery in the leg, um, it could be mistaken for osteophytes or loose structures, so it's important to be aware of that. And um, it's important to know the variation in diagnosing and treating patients with pathology in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so what happened is that this was only reported in one case, and uh, with that, you have the fibella compressing the popliteal artery, but most of the time, it's, uh, let me go back to this slide. So in that case, the fibella was found to be a little enlarged in, th in that case, and it compressed the popliteal artery. So 
it was basically like straightforward to explain. How, how was the symptom? So the symptom that the patient presented with is uh, unilateral like pain, right? The patient just presented with pain, decreased sensation, and um, they treated it within two days. So they diagnosed it, they, they had a problem like trying to come up with a diagnosis because it wasn't described before in the literature. So only when they did the CT angio, then they saw that it was being compressed and then they removed the whole fabella. How large was the fabella? The fabella was 21 millimeters. So in that case. The pain is the pain is there, like um, as they walk, but it's worse on fully extending. So when you fully extend and they said that the pain is worse, is one of the things that helps you to think about fibula pain syndrome. Any other questions? Okay, thank, thank you. you.